They're releasing another Mad Max movie so soon? I thought it was gonna be called Wasteland. Oh, this one's set in space? We're out of space! And there's dialogue? Feel free to applaud. <laughs> Journey across a hyper-violent, post-apocalyptic wasteland with lovably insane characters hunting for mythical treasure. I'm the only one who can open the vault. Welcome to Pandora, the anarcho-techno-capitalist dystopia of Borderlands. With over $1 billion in sales, this beloved series has captivated millions. But can it make the leap from gaming monitors to the big screen? When Lionsgate announced a movie adaptation back in 2015, fans were cautiously optimistic. After all, Borderlands has all the ingredients for a great blockbuster. With over 77 million copies sold, it boasts a unique cel-shaded visual style, Monty Python-esque writing, and colorful characters that leap off the screen. This gun doesn't seem to work. Mmm, I don't know. <laughs> Looks like it works to me. Did we mention the space worms? Or the guns? Because there are lots of guns. Guns that shoot grenades. Guns that are grenades. Alien guns. And and even guns that shoot guns. It's a smorgasbord of chaos and creativity that seems tailor-made for Hollywood. Seems like a safe bet for Lionsgate to throw a hundred million dollars behind the film. What could possibly go wrong? It's morbid time. Well, as they say, with great IPs come great fan expectations. And for this one, Fans are divided, to put it diplomatically. After nine years of creative issues, changes in writers, and a round of the dreaded reshoots, finally, the release is near. But the challenges are stacking up like psycho bodies in Frostburn Canyon. From controversial casting decisions to puzzling story choices, even down to the film's PG-13 rating, Lionsgate is walking a tightrope over a pit of rabbit's gags. The built-in audience is there, hungry for loot and laughs. But can this star-studded cast capture the manic energy and crude humor that made the games legendary? Or will they end up discarded by fans like a white weapon drop? And let's face it, in a galaxy far, far oversaturated with space-adventuring bands of misfits, Borderlands needs to prove it's more than just not Guardians of the Galaxy, which around 17% of the audiences already dismiss it as. We've pulled thousands of movie lovers, scoured the internet, and crunched the numbers to find out what you, the fans, are saying about it. Let's talk about the characters. Borderlands offers players a choice of various Vault Hunters across its games, and the movie's lineup is, well, let's just say it's raised some eyebrows. Here's what we're looking at. From the first game, we've got Roland and Lilith, two of the original four playable Vault Hunters. Then there's Creek, a playable character added as DLC in Borderlands 2. Rounding out the main poster cast are some fan-favorite NPCs, Tiny Tina, Patricia Tannis, and everyone's favorite annoying robot, Claptrap, who, to be fair, was playable in the pre-sequel. Some of these choices make perfect sense. Lilith, after all, can be argued to be the central protagonist of the franchise, and most related to big plot points. Krieg was the player's favorite overall Vault Hunter from 20 available, picked by 17% of the players, while Tiny Tina won favorite character overall, beating Handsome Jack by just half a percent. So while we can see why these particular characters were chosen, there is a material difference between who are your favorite characters and who would you want as the the core crew in a movie. Speaking of Handsome Jack, the charismatic villain of the first two games is inexplicably absent from the roster and cast list. Some fans are speculating that Eli Roth will take the role for himself, a fan theory that has been particularly well received. Roland, interestingly, is the least favorite Vault Hunter from the first game, according to the fan base. However, his inclusion makes sense to pair up with Lilith, considering the plot of the games. Spoilers. No spoilers. However, fans seem more concerned about the missing Vault Hunters. In fact, 20% of the comments to the main trailer lament the lack of Brick and Mordecai, whose absence is as notable as the missing big bushy mustache from Mark Wahlberg's upper lip in the Uncharted movie. Mordecai was the most popular character in the first game, picked by 33% of fans thanks to his cool sniper rifle and pet bird, Bloodwing. As for Brick, yeah, you get it. Neither of these fan favorites appear on the cast list. This character lineup has left fans with mixed feelings. Excitement for some beloved characters making it to the big screen, disappointment over the missing ones, but mostly confusion. Since the movie mixes characters from different games, who technically do cross paths with each other at some points, the timeline of what the film is going for seemingly makes little sense, and legions of dedicated gamer fans are not likely to let details like this go. Did we mention Mark Wahlberg's bare upper lip in Uncharted? This temporal jumble is just one of the reasons fans are leaving comments like, Borderlands movie made by people who never played Borderlands. But hold on to your loot boxes, folks, because the the other major reason for fan outcry is the casting choices, and boy do we have lots to talk about there. For starters, Kevin Hart plays the role of Roland, the soldier. Hart is known for his comedic roles and stand-up comedy, selling out arenas and cementing himself as a household name. He's been in dozens of movies since his start in the early 2000s, and is one of, if not the most bankable star in recent years. In fact, if we take his films from the last 10 years, 12 out of 15 made over double their budget at the domestic box office, and an astounding 14 out of 15 made over 1.9x. But all these were comedic roles where his timing and terrier-like energy could shine. In the game, Roland is categorically not funny. He's battle-hardened and stoic. He is also tall, all things Hart does not bring to the screen. 
Wow, I just disappeared. <laughs> Although some articles are saying that casting him is a good omen for the movie, keeping the comedic elements of the game. You know, he's a funny man, the games are funny, this could work. He also does a hell of a lot for audience outreach. He's very active on social media, where he's been promoting the film to his 179 million Instagram followers. While he is great for attracting lovers of action comedy, fans of the game are outraged at the casting and seriously worried about what Hollywood is going to do to their beloved source material. In fact, our analysis shows that almost 29% of discussions about the movie feature complaints about Hart's casting as Roland. Next up is a Academy Award winner Kate Blanchett, who is a surprise casting for Lilith the Siren. Blanchett is an incredibly versatile and well-respected actor known for serious dramas like The Aviator and Tar, as well as big blockbusters like Thor Ragnarok. To many though, she's best known for her role in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit trilogy, which also bodes well for recruiting adjacent audiences. Our research says that fans of fantasy show affinity for Borderlands, so having her familiar face could be a big draw. The big comment from fans though, revealed by our social listening, is her age. Not to be all toxic Hollywood about it, but Lilith in the game is in her 20s. While we know how good the aging technology has gotten, and as fresh-faced as Blanchett looks for her 55 years, she ain't in her 20s. Again, it just seems like an odd and so deliberate deviation from the canon, and while nearly 28% of comments mentioned her casting choice, a good chunk of those were just to point out the age discrepancy. Well, no wonder. It's all old and dried out. But honestly, if Kate Blanchett wants to be in your movie, you should probably just let her, especially if she can bring with her legions of fantasy fans. As director Eli Roth put it, the combination of the two of us, it's mixing Elizabeth and Hostel, Tar and Thanksgiving. You've seen her twirl a baton, but wait until you see her twirl a gun. With that kind of enthusiasm from both star and director, who knows? This unexpected casting might just be the secret sauce Borderlands needs. Continuing the theme of very talented and respected actors who are much older than their character, Jamie Lee Curtis joins the crew as Tannis, another actor with a lot of name recognition, an Oscar, and whose broad appeal probably outweighs any downsides brought about by disappointing the diehards, who will probably watch the movie regardless. Getting her start as the face of the Halloween franchise, before moving on to performances in films like True Lies alongside The Governator, and A24's Oscar vacuum everything everywhere all at once, Curtis's work can draw fans from a huge range of genres, some of which, like horror, crime, and sci-fi, show particular affinity for Borderlands. Let's also not forget that with a rating of PG-13, a lot of parents are going to end up escorting their kids to the theater, and including Curtis and Blanchett will appeal to the 35 plus age range who, according to our data, really under-index an interest in the movie. And finally we come to Jack Black voicing Claptrap the robot. While about 10% of fans are missing the original voice actor from the game, who became iconic as the little robot guided you through worlds and missions, there are plenty who feel Black is the perfect choice. Let's not forget, he did just voice Bowser in a video game adaptation that made over a billion dollars. Moreover, Black and Hart are a duo that audiences love to see, as evident from the success of the Jumanji movies. This pairing alone could be a significant draw for the general public. While the original voice actor might be recognizable to fans, Jack Black is approximately seven times more recognizable to general moviegoers. See what I mean? Another casting choice that makes great business sense, even if it does raise some eyebrows among fans of the games. But screw them, right? They've only spent a collective billion dollars on the games over the years. Who needs to make them happy? Rounding out the stack cast are Ariana Greenblatt and Florian Montianu. Greenblatt plays explosive expert and preteen Tiny Tina. She's best known for her role as Sasha in Barbie. And while great child actors are notoriously hard to find, Greenblatt is one of those rare talents. She's a rising star in Hollywood, but it's worth noting that she likely won't be attracting a significant number of moviegoers on her own just yet. Unfortunately, Tiny Tina's character doesn't seem to have translated well to the big screen, at least based on the trailer. Her signature manic energy seems to be missing, with many comments specifically mentioning her calmer demeanor and the absence of her usual explosive-related dialogue. This has become the biggest complaint among fans, expressed by 32% of those discussing the movie. However, Florian Montianu seems to be the best casting choice according to fans. While his name on the cast list does not yet pique fans' interest, his abs in the trailer sure do. The only unanimously positive response from fans cast-wise was him as Krieg, with many commenting on how his physique and body movements perfectly capture the character. Let's just hope he nails Krieg's iconic lines like, I'm the conductor of the poop train! And, I have the shiniest meat bicycle! So we have a cast that carries a lot of star power and boasts an impressive track record of success. However, it doesn't seem to match well with characters from the game, offending some fans in the process. But here's where it gets interesting and where we need to be cautious about social listening data. Our analysis shows that audiences are around 1.5 times more likely to leave a negative comment compared to a positive one. This is consistent with research on product reviews, where negative reviews are 1.3 times more common. The bias stems from what psychologists call the negativity bias. Essentially, our brains are wired to react more strongly to negative experiences. Negative emotions are processed more thoroughly, making them feel more urgent and lasting longer in our memories. This is why people are more motivated to voice their dissatisfaction than their contentment. This is why you should maybe call your parents more often. Another major point about the cast is that it's predominantly female. While female-led casts didn't really work out for Furiosa, and similarly to action shooters, the apocalyptic scavenger wastelands are typically male-leaning, as we discussed 
in our Furiosa video. For Borderlands, it might actually play out well. This is because the Borderlands franchise has a unique relationship with its female audience. The video game's player base, while still majority male, strongly over-indexes on female players compared to other titles in the action shooter genre. This success in attracting female gamers is largely attributed to the game's focus on good character writing and the presence of badass female characters. If Lionsgate successfully mirrors and leverages these elements, they have the potential to hit 43% female attendance. But casting concerns and trying to guess how bad the story of an as-yet unreleased movie will be are all just speculation. Let's take a look at what we can actually see, the marketing materials. So far we've got two trailers. The first trailer racked up 16 million views between the Lionsgate and Borderlands YouTube channels. Not bad and it's a testament to the loyalty of the fans. It's potentially a good sign, considering that one of the numbers most highly correlated with ticket sales is still trailer views. However, this didn't help Madam Web with almost double the amount of views, and it's relatively low compared to other recent video game movie trailers. The trailer itself has a very detailed explanation of the world, gunshots rhythmically synced to an upbeat 70s pop song, Kevin Hart one-liners, and Jack Black doing Jack Black things. And as we mentioned previously, this caused quite a stir amongst fans, unleashing a wave of criticism. Amidst comments about Kevin Hart's height not being suitable for Roland, Blanchett's age not matching Lilith, and Tiny Tina looking like she's finally taken enough benzos to sit still, it was truly difficult to find anything positive. Although 13% of comments did mention the strong set design and accuracy of the weapon. But honestly, you have to scroll far down in the comments to find anything positive, and it seems to have guaranteed that a lot of people won't be going to the theaters to see it. It also has an appalling like to dislike ratio, almost 1 to 2, which is just a little better than that of Madam Web. But remember, a pinch of salt here as us humans love to complain, and discussion outside YouTube has been relatively positive. Furthermore, our test screening of the trailer to a mixed audience, including both fans and those unfamiliar with the game, yielded far more positive results. With everyone required to provide feedback, 83% reported liking the trailer. Meanwhile, the negative comments were more focused on the overall tone, visual effects, and still Kevin Hart hate, although this time more on his comedy rather than his suitability for the role. We're sure he'll cry about it all the way to his next sold out stadium show. The final trailer, aka the second trailer, released late July, and it does seem that Lionsgate took note of some of the criticism. The tone is less quippy, darker, focused more on the scale of adventure and lore of the world, like putting the legend of the vault front and center. It also introduces the narration that that's used to set up the game, a commonly cited missing feature from the first trailer. They even gave fans a better shot of Mad Moxie, although also about 20 years older than her in-game counterpart. But even still, the comments are a hail of negativity, albeit entertainingly expressed. The like-to-dislike ratio is also a little better, almost one-to-one, -one, but the trailer barely broke one-third of a million views in two days. It's over 9,000! So there goes the trailer views count to box office correlation cope. To be fair to the fans, they also had more grievances than just the cast. Many complained about the jokes being too crass. Not that Borderlands shies away from some good old toilet humor, but it does tend to be a little bit more nuanced than what is seen in the trailer at least according to fans. The release of the trailers did see a noticeable spike in Borderlands players on Steam though, first in April and May, then again in July after the second trailer. Nostalgia can be a powerful driver for box office success, with films like The Invincibles 2 pulling in $1.2 billion 14 years after the first one was released, and even this year's Despicable Me 4 having a $75 million opening weekend seven years after the last installment. The Borderlands Twitter page posted short 15 second character intro clips, which was just another opportunity to show how little attention they paid to the source material. Nobody cares. As Tannis points out her love of fashion, and Roland cracks a joke about Taco Night. To be fair, the Krieg one, again, seemed to be the best received. We also were treated to some BTS footage in the form of a special feature, which is really just a part of the press kit of interviews and on-set photography that can be cut into promo materials. While it's always good to have the stars gushing about the film and the source material, and even better if they're in costume, the audience reaction was more of the same. So it seems that Lionsgate have not done overwhelmingly well at recruiting fans of the games through the marketing, but they're clearly casting a wider net, aiming for a broader audience that extends beyond the game's existing fan base. In particular, the movie focused on conventions such as CCXP and San Diego Comic-Con, two of the largest pop culture festivals in the world. With such a huge concentration of animation, comic book, and video game fans all in one place, going all out was a no-brainer. Unsurprisingly, fans of these mediums show high affinity for the film. Normally, we would suggest that something like a cosplay competition would be a good move here, to get some of that lovely user-generated content, aka free advertising. But considering that most fan cosplays would look so much closer to the in-game characters than the actual cast does, Maybe not on this one. Nothing like a side-by-side -side comparison to highlight those creative liberties in casting, right? Borderlands also featured on the cover of the Comic-Con Special Edition of Entertainment Weekly, and Lionsgate actually dropped the final trailer on the first day of the event and set up an immersive experience at the convention. Borderlands partnered with the world's second largest scotch, Valentine's, to create limited edition bottles named after Moxie, their chief galactic expansion officer, and exclusive cocktails that will be available at Moxie's bar. 
That's right, just like in the games. But the movie is PG-13, right? This is a continuation of the full-on Wasteland Motel that was set up in New Mexico in the lead-up to Comic-Con, sponsored by Mountain Dew, the OG gamer fuel that tasted like radioactive citrus sweat before all the new and hip influencer-promoted, powdered, and deliciously flavored stuff came out. While this is definitely cool fan service, it does wreck up the total budget for the film, putting even more pressure on its box office performance, especially if there's any hope of turning this into a franchise. The movie being a mainstream success could also alter the trajectory of the ever-elusive Borderlands 4. But in order to reach these levels of of success, Lionsgate have to leverage the cast. That's gotta be the whole point behind spending what must have been a pretty sizable chunk of their production budget on actors who are mostly not very similar to their beloved in-game characters, right? We mentioned Kevin Hart's huge social media following, and this week has seen him appear on America's number one newscast in all key target demographics, Good Morning America, to promote the movie as well. Jack Black's 14 million followers retreated to a post of the trailer back in February, but nothing since. Understandable, as he probably has other things on his mind. But he has been doing interviews with the likes of Entertainment Weekly to reach a wider audience. Kate Blanchett's April interview in Empire Magazine, the best-selling film magazine on the planet, may do well to bring in older audiences, as their readership does skew to the 35-plus group. While her half-million-plus Instagram followers pales in comparison to some of her co-stars, she has been promoting the film fairly consistently over the last six months. And most importantly, her fans would probably not even know that the Borderlands games exist if it weren't for her. So while on the surface it appears the movie has doomed itself by having its audience by abandoning the source material, there may be hope in the extreme box office appeal of Kevin Hart, Jamie Lee Curtis, especially since her resurgence in Everything Everywhere All at Once and FX is the Bear, Kate Blanchett, and Jack Black's voice. We're imagining him doing a musical interlude, although considering that Claptrap is more of a beatbox dubstep guy, this would be the ultimate middle finger to the fans but would boost the viral potential of the movie exponentially. So after a nine year wait, let's talk about the actual release. It's scheduled for wide release on the 9th of August. It's perfect for a summer blockbuster, but it does face some competition. The biggest rival will be Deadpool and Wolverine. It will have been out for three weeks on August 9th, but it still has a good chance to take away audiences from Borderlands, including high moviegoers who go to the movies once a month. Both films have an irreverent tone and feature a team up of violent characters, but Deadpool 3 does have that street cred earning R rating, as well as a proven big screen track record. Its $211 million opening weekend set the record for an R rated movie, taking the title from, that's right, Deadpool 1. It also somewhat surprisingly will face competition from M. Night Shyamalan's new film, Trap, which overlaps in the crime genre and in dark humor, although the trailer doesn't scream laugh fest. Beyond the competition, Borderlands will have to contend with that insidious word of mouth after test screening reactions were largely negative. Box office predictions sit at between 10 and 20 million for opening weekend, which does not bode well for the movie any potential sequels, or even expanding the reach of Borderlands 4. Hey, who knows, maybe if they keep plugging that Claptrap popcorn bucket or Funko Pop figures enough, they can convince people to part with their hard-earned cash. So there you have it. As you can tell, this one is a little personal to us here at Popcorn. Yeah! Although the cold hard data remains unbiased. But we want to know what you think about it. Did you put hours into the games and are now insulted by Lionsgate's offering? Are you just happy it's getting a movie at all? Maybe you've never heard of the game and think this just looks like a fun popcorn movie. Let us know in the comments and head on over to Popcorn to tell the studios exactly what you think about the movies they make. And for more analysis like this, check out our last video about chasing after a dream in a post-apocalyptic desert wasteland, Furiosa, on screen now. Click me and subscribe.